Okay, I'm going to um, talk about the work I've done uh, in collaboration with um, people at NASA, with Adolfo Vinius, as well as my uh, past postdocs, Yana Maneva, Natalia Ozak, and Pablo Moya. So, basically, uh, you can also look at uh, living reviews uh, in solar physics, which was recently updated a couple of years ago, that has a lot of the background information if you want to read in more detail about the topics I'm going to talk about. So, starting from the very basic uh, aspect, we are looking at the uh, coronal energy balance, which is basically the source of our solar wind. In the background, you see an SDO movie running showing the corona in various wavelengths that correspond to different temperatures. So as you can see, um, the corona loses energy through uh, three main processes, which is conduction, radiation, and through the solar wind. And the losses are different in different parts of uh, the corona. Of course, in uh, coronal holes, which is the main focus of my talk today, um, we have losses through conduction, uh, which are uh, smaller than in other regions because the temperature there is usually lower. The radiation is also um, smaller due to the lower density of the plasma in coronal holes. And uh, we have losses by the energy flux carried uh, by the solar wind, which is the primary um, source of the losses. So with still trying to understand the, the heating mechanisms and the acceleration mechanisms, as you all know. But another interesting aspect uh, that sort of makes the stellar connection, uh, you can see that the solar wind, you, the sun is losing mass through the solar wind. And it is uh, comparable to the mass loss by the equivalent of the radiation. If we convert the energy of the radiation to mass, we will get about the same uh, number. But it loses mass very slowly only 10 to the 14 solar mass, minus 14 solar masses per year. So looking at the uh, measurements, this is a, a Ulysses observation that shows the uh, solar corona uh, at, two stage, uh, at two stages of the solar cycle. On the left is uh, the solar minimum, where the separation between the fast and slow solar wind is very clear. As you can see, uh, this is a radial plot. Uh, the solar wind speed is uh, nearly constant, uh, around 800 kilometers per second at its terminal velocity in the polar regions. While in the equatorial regions, of course, we have much uh, slower wind, and uh, there is high variability. But that variability, of course, is a combination of the variable outflow speed and uh, the variable uh, structures. Uh, through which the spacecraft is passing. This is basically all structures here because of the long time period of the orbit. On the right, we can see the, the slow wind. The slow wind, of course, um, is much uh, slower and denser than the fast wind. And during maximum, it occupies the whole um, heliosphere, or most of the heliosphere, as you can see in the second pass. This is the sunspot number. So this corresponds to the maximum. So I will be primarily talking about the acceleration and heating of the uh, fast wind. The slow wind, of course, there is the uh, one can give a different talk just on that. So we're going to limit ourselves to the, to the fast wind. So um, of course, we have uh, missions that are aimed at studying the sources or the acceleration of the uh, solar wind. And uh, we see the, uh, the Solar Pro Plus mission, which in, with an upcoming launch date of uh, end of July 2018. And uh, what you can see here on the left is a schematic presentation, uh, representation of the solar wind as a function of the heliocentric distance. And this is the, the alpha speed. So uh, when the solar wind speed, of course, is equal to the uh, uh, alpha speed, this is the alphanic point. And this occurs uh, maybe at 10 to 20 solar radii. Now, um, all the previous missions uh, were limited in this region, where the solar wind is already super alphanic and accelerated. Uh, now, the solar probe is the first mission that will go inside this uh, alphanic uh, region, where the wind is still subalphanic and is accelerating. 
as well as the acceleration of energetic particles is occurring in this region. So this region is uh, only completely unexplored, you may say. The only exploration in that region uh, that we have is remote sensing. Um, perhaps uh, in the extended corona, as we see by, uh, from LASCO, and uh, also from IPS measurements that show uh, propagating fluctuations uh, that were interpreted as, uh, as waves in that region. But we don't have, uh, of course, NC2 measurements there. The other mission uh, that is relevant to, to this talk is the solar orbiter mission, uh, also to be launched in October 2018. Um, it will, it, it's not going to go as close as the Solar Pro Plus, only to 0.28 AU, but um, it has a much larger suite of instruments, including visualizations, uh, ion detectors, and so on. Uh, of course, the Solar Pro Plus because of its uh, more uh, high requirements from thermal shield and energetics has a, a smaller suite of instruments. Uh, the other aspect that is important here that this mission will go out of the ecliptic uh, plane up to uh, 34 degrees. So it will sort of catch the, the fast solar wind uh, directly while the solar pro plus is confined to, to the ecliptic. So. Some of you may be familiar with this plot. <laughs> so here we can see the main um, uh, sort of two aspects of uh, coronal heating, two, two main mechanisms being discussed. Of course, there are others, but uh, uh, these are the, the primary ones um, that have uh, been talked about. So there are two uh, aspects. One is the AC mechanism, where everything is variable. And that includes waves, shocks, uh, and turbulence. And then there is the DC mechanism, which is the Parker type, uh, slower evolution. So uh, where we have the magnetic field, the uh, foot points driven by um, convective motion in the sun. So uh, now in the uh, open flux of the fast solar wind, there is no much uh, possibility for uh, twisting and braiding, except maybe very low uh, in the coronal hole. Uh, so the primary mechanism for for open flux, uh, which was realized by Parker himself, is the um, AC mechanism. So you have uh, waves, possibly shocks. And uh, of course, we have uh, inhomogeneities that are present, and they can enhance the dissipation due to waves and um, due to turbulence. And turbulence also um, connects between the two mechanisms, because reconnection can lead to uh, say, uh, formation of jets that can lead to turbulence. And uh, we have the, uh, the waves that also can uh, cause uh, uh, turbulence. Now, there are two types of turbulence. There is the weak turbulence, where still one can look at the fluctuations as an ensemble of waves. And there is strong uh, turbulence when uh, the waves lose their identity, basically, and everything is coupled. So in the solar wind, is basically, we have weak turbulence. Uh, in general. So now, how this typical um, solar wind uh, spectra looks like. So this is uh, based on wind data. And uh, there are three, um, of course, so first what we see here, this is a power spectrum of uh, magnetic uh, fluctuations as a, power, as a function of uh, f frequency. The frequency range here is uh, very large, as you can see, maybe eight uh, orders of magnitude or so. So uh, you can see that at very low frequencies, we have this um, f to the minus 1 uh, spectrum of fl uh, fluctuations. And uh, then at some intermediate range, we have a steeper slope, which is typically f to the minus 5 thirds. And the steeper spectrum at higher frequency, that, that steep coincides with the uh, transition to resonant uh, frequency, ion cyclotron resonance, as you can see here. Now, um, one also must be careful when interpreting these uh, data, because uh, when a spacecraft uh, travels through the solar wind, uh, we basically have a single point measurement. And then, of course, there are structures as well. And they uh, can contribute, at least at la on large scales, these structures can uh, contribute to our uh, 
uh, temporal fluctuations and appear as some uh, frequency, but this is not uh, necessarily waves. So, um, but in this, uh, in the high frequency domain, of course, we are approaching the, the pure wave or weak turbulence uh, uh, spectrum. So, yes. Well, this is uh, this is typical. Uh, I mean, it is not uh, necessarily a property of this turbulence of the variability. This is just a, a measurement. But you can see here is another measurement, and of course there is more uh, small scale fluctuation. So you see more variability in amplitude. So uh, and there is uh, the dissipation actually takes place here. So then the, the small scales could be dissipated uh, more rapidly. So what you see here another important property of this that the breakpoint of the fluctuation is uh, moving to a lower frequency as we uh, move away from the sun and this is of course uh, intuitively one can uh, understand that uh, from the fact that um, the magnetic field on average is weakening as we move away so the uh, all the relevant uh, cyclotron dissipation frequencies become uh, uh, smaller. So then we move to smaller frequencies. So uh, now uh, this is, these are measurements uh, from 0.3 to uh, 0.9 AU. Uh, now moving uh, further, as you can see here, on the left, this is our ACE measurements that show this picture similar to wind with a break point here due to the transition from turbulent spectrum uh, with this uh, scaling uh, basically similar to what we would expect from Komogorov uh, turbulence, which was derived by fluid. These effects, of course, here are non-fluid. They are already kinetic uh, dissipation effects. Now, however, we want to understand what happens really from the sun to the uh, to one AU. And this is uh, a plot from Kranman van Willegorn showing the um, measurements of the fluctuations as they were uh, obtained in various parts of the heliosphere. This is log scale. So this is from very close to the sun, from summer, and then off limb, this is UVCS. Uh, and there is a gap here, which hopefully will be filled by the solar probe. Plus, then we see the, the IPS measurements. However, there is a ambiguity with the measurements of IPS because of, uh, again, the feature of convecting structures versus uh, real waves as they travel uh, between the observer and um, uh, distant radio source. Okay, and then we have in situ, which is uh, at point uh, three AU. But this is um, this is a theoretical fit from uh, the uh, theory developed uh, by Kranmer et al. Of, of the uh, magnetic and velocity fluctuation, basically uh, using um, uh, WKB um, uh, theory. So. Um, in WKB, basically, there one neglects uh, uh, the effect of uh, reflections, or one can include it to some extent, but there are limitations because uh, the, the waves are not uh, fully modeled, but they, there is an approximation. However, it allows you to describe uh, very large scales uh, in that model. So now, going now to a region of interest uh, to present <laughs> audience. In the inner corona, of course, we have comp data. Uh, this is from Tomczyk at, and Macintosh 2009, showing that we uh, recover a power law spectra, indeed close to the sun in these measurements. And it is sort of uh, close to what we get uh, at 1 AU. However, there is uh, the effect of um, PMOS, for example, uh, and that changes sort of the, the, the spectrum balance because the spectrum is still evolves when we are close to the sun. There is also a possible contribution of structures. They, they don't have a 
pure Alphen wave, but you have uh, kink modes, basically uh, a form of fast multisonic uh, waves that can couple to uh, Alphen waves uh, in those structures. So when we are dealing with uh, open flux uh, of the Coulomb hole, then um, the background structure effects are already much smaller. So we have uh, mainly alphenic fluctuations propagating outwards at uh, 10 solar radii or not. Now this is a more recent uh, measurement of, uh, of the magnetic fluctuation. This is from a messenger spacecraft. Uh, and one can see um, these are the various ion resonances marked here. And uh, one can see the outward and inward uh, propagating wave spectra. They have, again, similar structure. Now, uh, another uh, way to obtain spectra is by looking at non-thermal line broadening. And this was uh, done since uh, the days of uh, UVCS, uh, or they assumed that what is seen is the effects of uh, waves. Uh, here is a measurement that uh, is interpreted in terms of uh, uh, alpha waves very close to the sun. And you can see here, this is a emission from various ions and then on thermal broadening in kilometers per second, uh, increasing as one looks up to a certain height, then there is a, a plateau. And this is, this is the, the dot, dotted line here, or the dashed line, uh, corresponds to what uh, WKB theory would predict, the n to the minus one quarter uh, dependence as expected from WKB. So uh, possible departure from WKB is due to reflection, dissipation, and the structure in the in the lower corona. Okay, this is uh, again uh, uh, reminding ourselves of the uh, ground-based measurements that show evidence of uh, alpha waves or uh, possibly kink waves in the uh, lower corona. But we have structures, so so they are coupled to other modes. Uh, the problem is that these measurements at least show that there is no sufficient energy flux. Uh, in the uh, in the fluctuations, the magnetic MHD fluctuations. However, uh, uh, this could be the results of um, integration over line of sight and limited uh, resolution uh, of the instrument. Uh, so, but this is still work in progress, right? Uh -huh. So now, what can we do from the modeling uh, point of view in order to understand better uh, the solar wind? Of course, we had the uh, Parker solution that was already uh, achieved uh, in '58, I think, they got a solution uh, for 1D. But uh, we see that structures are important and waves are important. So, so first one can solve a set of uh, polytropic uh, MHD equations. Uh, now, this is uh, our continuity. This is momentum equation. So, in the momentum equation. In addition to the um, uh, thermal pressure, gravity, and the Lorentz force, and the viscous force, one can add uh, a force due to the wave. This is the, the WKB model. So instead of modeling the, the magnetic fluctuations due to the wave, one adds um, a force uh, that accelerates the solar wind, basically. And then one can also add this into the energy equation. Right? So in a, then, to look at the next level of complication, one can include the thermal conduction. And we see here, this is our momentum input uh, due to the waves. And uh, we can have heat input due to the wave. Then can be uh, heat conduction as well. Radiation in coronal holes, uh, as you've seen, is uh, radiative losses are small. So it's not necessary to include it in the coronal hole. So, uh, of course, these, um, the effects of wave and the acceleration of the solar wind by waves was studied since the, the 60s. So what is the, the current, uh, more recent status of this? This is a recent model by Oran et al., uh, 3D MHD model showing a cut in the um, in polar plane. And uh, what you can see here. So th these are the red regions, are the, the fast solar wind, as you can see. This is at solar minimum, uh, 700 kilometers per second. And uh, the green is the, the slow wind. Uh, the um, dark line is the alphenic surface. So 
how this um, solution is achieved. So one starts with a dipole, basically, and then add the wave pressure. Okay, and this is so WKB wave-driven wind. When one solves into, in addition to the MHD equations I showed you on previous slide, uh, this uh, supplemental equation for the counter-propagating waves. And we see that this is the W plus W minus of inward and outward propagating waves. And then there's this heating term uh, due to these waves. So one can uh, include these effects and uh, get the fast and slow wind by adjusting sort of the um, parameters of the WKB uh, waves. Now, this has been done um, for a while. But it is also interesting to see what happens if we try to include waves explicitly, not just through WKB. And this was also done uh, a while ago uh, by myself and uh, the villa. And here you can see the, the result of such a model that, that uh, does not include WKB, but the waves as explicit source of uh, momentum, acceleration of the solar wind. So, so this, this is the, these are the alphanic fluctuations, as you can see, of the 40 solar radii. The green line shows the Parker solution without waves. And then for different wave frequencies, you get uh, more efficient momentum transfer of lower frequencies. And you can see the formation of the, of the fast wind. But in addition to the um, transverse fluctuation, there, is also, there are also compressive fl fluctuations. At least um, in this region, they can steepen into shock as one looks uh, farther from the sun. This is. This was done in a two and a half uh, D model. So you can see this is the radial outflow. And you can see the fast wind in the middle here with the compressive fluctuations and shocks. And these are the, the slow wind uh, region, uh, regions. Now, recently, I have not seen that there was uh, uh, much progress in uh, implementing this in, uh, in 3D models. However, there was progress in, in 1D models. Uh, uh, instead of starting from the corona, this is a work by Suzuki and Inotsuka, um, they did the wave-driven wind, where they looked at a single flux tube, as, as uh, uh, shown here in these cartoons. But instead of start starting at corona, at the corona is the boundary, they started really from the photosphere and uh, driven the photospheric uh, motions. They driven the wind through the photospheric motion. So they show this. Uh, Result, and this is the the red line is the result of the simulation, and these uh, dots and uh, circles with arrow bars are the results of uh, various measurements. So just by uh, providing a spectrum of fluctuations at the uh, photosphere, they are able to reproduce uh, the, the fast solar wind. Some observed properties of the fast solar wind. This is the velocity, temperature electron density and this is this is the these are the fluctuations the transverse fluctuations so not through wkb uh, one way to extend it is of course to consider not only a single fluid plasma but the effects of uh, um, various uh, components such as uh, electrons uh, protons and uh, alphas or other heavy ions as uh, separate um, fluids and this was, um, as you can see, you get this set of coupled fluctuations. Of course, the uh, uh, Lorentz force is now is not the, the full Lorentz force, but the partial Lorentz force due to the H ions. And they are coupled uh, electromagnetically as well as uh, collisionally close to the sun. So they get the three fluid uh, solution. You have three temperature equations for each particle species. So this was. Uh, uh, done also a while ago, and as you can see here, this is the uh, solar wind uh, animation of the solar wind uh, fluctuations in the perpendicular direction. These are the power fluctuations. The solar wind is accelerating, and these are the electron temperature obtained from uh, such a model. Of course, you can also look at ions and uh, their properties. And uh, this is the, the spectrum that you can get. Um, from this model. This is the power spectrum of the, but this is MHD, so this dissipation is not uh, kinetic dissipation, but uh, due to the um, 
fluid dissipations in the in the multi-fluid MHD. Uh, so, but you can get uh, reasonable solutions of the solar wind. You can get faster helium than protons or faster oxygen than, than protons. Of course, you need to vary some of the parameters of your model, uh, such as the amplitude of the alpha and wave. And uh, the interesting point is that even when you supply enough um, energy flux in MHD waves, for in the multi-fluid models, you can get fast moving protons. But then you find you still need to provide extra heating uh, to the heavy ions if one wants to match the observed properties. Because if you don't do that, you just get that the heavy ions are uh, slower, as you would expect intuitively, uh, than protons. And they are also cooler. So because you would need more energy if you have the same amount of uh, energy flux in the wave. But uh, we're talking about MHD wave. So if we have resonant wave, then the picture changes completely. Then uh, this is represented here in the multi-fluid model by providing uh, extra heating, uh, almost orders of order of magnitude more per particle in order to get to match the observations. Yes. Of energy you put in the atoms, or how do you yes. this thing? So you just, it's a fudge factor. Well, you have for the, you can run the model without any um, heating. Okay? You can just heat and accelerate by, by the waves. But when you do that, okay, this is a sort of very minor heating. And you can also, th in this case, the protons are not heated entirely. They are not heated uh, by any heating function, just by waves. Then you find, in order to get this helium flowing faster by the alpha and speed, as we see at 1 AU, and also some evidence from spectroscopic data, that you need to heat the, the ions with this heating function. So just the wave, the non-resonant waves in the multi-fluid model are not sufficient to provide the properties of the heavy ions. But this is in the second part of the talk where we'll address what happens when you do include the resonant waves. So this is the, for these solutions, you can get, of course, the temperature profiles. Uh, for the, this is for the heavy ions, protons, electrons, and uh, the density. These are model results for different sets of parameters. So one can do a parametric study and see which set of parameters best fits uh, your observing. Uh, point. Now, however, looking at the velocity distributions, this is from uh, Helios data from Marsh et al. 82. One can see that the um, d velocity distributions are far from Maxwellian, especially when we are looking at the fast wind. So this is slow wind, this is some intermediate range, and this is fast wind. So. The direction of the magnetic field is shown by this uh, uh, dashed line. So you can see that the velocity distributions are highly anisotropic. That means that they are wider here perpendicular to the field compared to the direction parallel to the field. And this, this temperature anisotropy uh, is very uh, strong in the fast wind as you look close to the sun. Of course, it decreases as you go farther out. Uh, the other thing you see is this little patch here, which is basically a beam. And uh, that means that you have some particles that are moving faster than the bulk of the population. So in, in fluid models, of course, the inherent assumption is that everything is isotropic. There are no, uh, the kinetic effects are averaged out. Now, maybe in the slow wind, it is OK, because as you can see, except very close to the sun. Uh, here, the distribution is close to being Maxwellian. So another clue that we get is that when we look at the relation between the anisotropy, as I just mentioned, shown on the, on the left scale, with the parallel temperature of uh, the protons. Okay, And we see that um, all the measurements fall into this uh, let's say, Brazil-type uh, map, OK? And um, then the question arises, why, why do we see all these uh, data within this range? This is also from wind data. This is ACE, and this is wind. So um, 
of course, we know from linear theory that uh, if the anisotropy, temperature anisotropy, when it's not, uh, when it's different from one, can drive an instability. Okay, and here these curves here mark the thresholds of uh, these instabilities. There is a mirror mirror instability, the ion cyclone instability, and the firehose instability, and they are also marked here. So this sort of provides us a strong clue or direction of uh, study. That means if we if our plasma is anisotropic, right? and let's say it's high beta, then it will be subject to mirror instability. So if we have a point, a parcel of plasma with parameters here on this point or this point, yeah, then over a short time comparable to several tens maybe of gyro periods, the plasma will go unstable and the instability will move it in the parameter space into this box. So Let's say we have some process on the sun that generated plasma with any parameters outside of this box. The instabilities will uh, drive it inside that region. So it suggests that uh, these instabilities already uh, took hold because this is at 1 AU, right? So uh, whatever happened close to the sun resulted in uh, already these instabilities being below their threshold. So one of these instabilities that is important for our uh, understanding of heating is the ion cyclone instability. For those of you who are not familiar, you have a magnetic field, uh, let's say a straight magnetic field, then the ions are uh, gyrating around a field line with a, tip of, with a gyration frequency determined just by the charge to mass ratio and the magnetic field. So Z is the charge number, is the mass number, right? Uh, now let's say we're going to shake that field with the same frequency, right? So like on a swing, uh, the, the energy will be resonantly absorbed by the ion. So the amplitude will increase of the uh, perpendicular fluctuations. But this is, of course, single particle, right? Now when we have... Um, a collection of particles as we have in plasma, then we have um, collision, long range forces, and uh, short range forces. So, of course, as you move farther for the sun, there are no collisions, but there are still wave particle interactions. So, uh, the ensemble of the particles will be affected by the uh, ion cyclone instability. And, of course, you have this uh, resonance condition if the plasma is moving along the field. Then there is also a Doppler shift right, that you need to take into account for the resonance condition. So what we understand from this is that we have, and of course we can derive the expression relation by, by solving the linearized Vlasov equation for the ensemble uh, of particles. And this is an example of such a solution. On the top is for, for cold plasma, and you can see the, the proton branch and the alpha branches with the different uh, modes. Okay, these modes are resonant. Okay, they, and this is the fast mode. So this is not resonant. So left and polarized uh, fluctuations will be in resonance because of the charge of the ion. So then uh, you can heat the plasma very quickly by launching waves that are resonating uh, with the ions. And then you can see from here, the resonant frequency, of course, as I showed you in previous slide, depends on charge to mass ratio for a given magnetic field. So, so if you have a spectrum of waves, then the lower frequency waves will resonate with heavier ions or lower charge to mass ratio ions. And then uh, they will be heated first. And then the ions that have smaller charge to mass, like protons, for example, uh, sorry, larger ones, like protons that have unity, then they will be heated last. So first you're gonna heat the heavy ions. And that sort of connects to the picture which we already, which we know from observations, that the heavy ions are uh, hotter than uh, protons and electrons. 
And uh, from the fact that the modeling aspect, if you include these waves explicitly, uh, indeed you find that you need to include some additional source of energy to heat the heavy ions, because just the, um, the waves, the MHD waves, will not provide uh, results that agree with observations. This is the result of multi-fluid model. OK, so. But by heating, uh, you will draw some sort of uh, component of the RMS fluctuations perpendicular to the field. There's no collisions there. Either. Right, there are no, coll there are no binary collisions, but there are still wave-particle interactions that replace the um, effects of collisions. So indeed, plasma can become anisotropic and remain anisotropic if collisions are absent. But at certain threshold, it will undergo its own instability, and the anisotropy will not increase. And the other effect that you see is, of course, you have wave-particle uh, interactions and coupling to the parallel direction. So that energy, although you, you're going to pump energy the perpendicular direction, it will not increase indefinitely. At some point, the energy will be transferred to the parallel directions, direction through the wave-particle interaction. And are those treated explicitly? They are um, in, a, in a hybrid model, yes. They, or kinetic models and particle model, yeah. It, they are it is described so consistently. And there's a, yeah. So this is just a, OK. All right. Right. OK, so uh, of course, when you have a drift beam between the ions, then there is additional uh, source of instability. The magnetosonic instability also generates ion cyclotron waves. And uh, these waves uh, can also hit the ions. So now let's uh, go to our hybrid model. What is a hybrid model? Basically you want to concentrate on the ions, uh, describing them kinetically, just showing their equations of motion subject to the Lorentz force. While the electrons are still uh, treated as a background neutralizing massless fluid. The reason you can do that and you want to do that is because of the separation of time scales between the electrons and the protons. The mass ratio uh, of 2,000 leads to the fact that the resonance frequency of electrons is uh, 2,000 times higher. So uh, in order to describe uh, both time scales, you would need very high computational effort. Yes? Yeah, I was wondering what kind of frequencies are the resonant frequencies uh, for the magnetism? Well, the order of magnitude, of course, depends where we're looking because yeah. of the change in magnetic field. Close to the sun, this is, uh, sun will be kilohertz. And uh, far from the sun could be millihertz. Right? So there is a very large uh, variability throughout the heliosphere. So um, because we, we are interested in the ion heating and ion dynamics, uh, the hybrid modeling approach is the best uh, suited for this. And uh, we can uh, describe the kinetic, uh, kinetics of the ions uh, very efficiently. Now, another aspect of the hybrid model is the expanding box. Uh, the reason for that is that when we are looking in a, on a kinetic scale, our spatial scale is limited to um, several hundred uh, inertia length, in length of the protons. And that corresponds to maybe a box of 1,000 uh, by 1,000 by 1,000 kilometers at 10 solar radii. Uh, also, the time scales we're dealing with are the order of maybe several hundred or several thousand gyro periods, so it's not very long. Um, so we cannot really describe the parcel of plasma as it evolves from, let's say, 10 solar radii to 1 AU. So in order to overcome this difficulty, uh, one can use the expanding box model when one takes the, this box and makes the coordinate coordinates uh, perpendicular to the expansion uh, dependent on time. 
So they are sort of inflating, like uh, what one uses in uh, relativity, uh, for example. So uh, then we use this uh, Galilean transformation on the radius, and then we have this expansion factor that is basically our velocity divided by the radius times the time. So you can then transform your equations into uh, the system of coordinates, and then you can take into account, or one can take into account the expansion of the solar wind by um, introducing this uh, small expansion factor, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 4 in normalized uh, units. That means the, uh, the expansion speed of the solar wind divided by the distance times the uh, gyro period. So this is about uh, 10 to the minus 4, or minus, even 10 to the minus 5. But one can include that in the model and look at the effects of that. The other aspects, one wants to launch this wa these waves in our uh, system. And this is uh, some spectrum, f to the minus 1, uh, that one can launch from the boundary and look uh, on the evolution of the spectrum. Another uh, approach of uh, looking at initial spectrum is initiating some uh, k modes in a given range of modes described in your code. Okay, and uh, sort of specify some dependence, or k to the minus 1, and a given uh, amplitude of waves. This was uh, done or proposed by Vinyas et al., implemented by Maneva et al. So you can look at these uh, initial spectra, two types of initial spectra, the temporal one and the um, initial one. So for the initial spectrum, if you take one uh, large amplitude waves, as you can see here, these waves are subject to parametric instability. We, we know from MHD that we can get these large amplitude waves. So, but what happens in the kinetic regime? Basically, you get this uh, parametric instability, and this is uh, from the solution of the dispersion relation. And you can see these various uh, peaks for various branches of the, of the modes. But this is what you get from the hybrid uh, simulation. This is from Kaufman and Araneda. And you can see these um, frequencies at which you have the highest uh, growth rate of the parametric instability due to a given amplitude of uh, sort of the initial, the mother waves, and these are daughter waves that are generated in the model. So one aspect of this parametric instability was that you get uh, these beams. And you can get them both in protons. As you can see, this is temporal evolution here, going from left to right. And you see the formation of the beam in alpha and in protons due to the parametric instability. So one of the mechanisms that's been proposed for the formation of this beam and the acceleration along the field is indeed the parametric instability of the alpha waves. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, in this direction, I mean, a horizontal direction with the Yes. So it's it's mean uh, temperature is uh, higher in a parallel direction. Uh, not for the bulk. No, for the bulk of the distribution. Yeah. But generally. On average, yes. Yeah, parallel heating is occurring. Yeah, on average there is parallel heating, but um, the bulk of the plasma, and of course when you look at the temperature, look at the one over e of the peak, right? So the bulk of the plasma is not. Uh, this is this is why it's called a beam because it's sort of it's not a, par, a part of the core distribution, okay. right? So it's not just heating in the direction. Heating in the direction, then you would expect maybe an ellipse like this or this way. Yeah, there will be no preferential direction, right? There will be an ellipse, but this this is a, a beam. So the other. And effect, which is important, is again is the drift. So we show, we've seen the formation of a beam, but then this can also uh, cause the formation of a drift. So now, if you start with a drift, as you can see here, this is exaggerated, of course, to two alpha in speed just to make the evolution faster. You can see that within very short time, several tens of gyro periods, uh, the drift starts to relax. And then at the same time, you see heating of uh, both uh, helium and protons. And of course, as the beam instability generates ion cyclotron waves, uh, you can also see heating of the helium ions 
But then as their anisotropy increases, uh, the secondary waves, they emit uh, gradually he the helium ion. So uh, this is shown by the solid curve. The dash curve shows this effect of expansion. If you introduce solar wind expansion, this sort of works in the opposite direction and causes perpendicular cooling. But of course, if you have um, gradual expansion as shown by dashed curves, which is more realistic than this way very rapid expansion, then uh, the effect is really small and you still get uh, perpendicular heating of uh, helium and uh, protons. Uh, so, of course, if you have very large initial anisotropy, it will also very quickly relax and uh, will not affect the, the protons much. So, But the beam effect is uh, definitely provides um, the heating. So we can look also at the distribution between the parallel and perpendicular direction of the energies. And as you can see, initially everything goes into the perpendicular direction, but then gradually you start to heat uh, also in parallel direction uh, due to the phase space uh, diffusion, uh, as you can see here in the helium ions. The effect, of course, is much smaller for the protons. And here the, the evolution is slightly different. These are for two different drifts. This is very strong drift, and this is a weaker drift. So the evolution is much more, takes uh, longer because of the smaller growth rate of this instability. We can also look at the spectra of the um, waves that you generate by the kinetic effects. Now, because we are dealing here with um, waves that are all in the dissipation range, then the spectra is very steep. We don't get the uh, the Komogor of turbulence uh, in the drift case. But, uh, and then the, the, all the energy ends up in the, in the magnetic uh, fluctuations. Uh, let me skip that. But when you are dealing with a driven source of waves, then of course you recover this uh, Komogor of turbulence, and you see also the effects of the break due to the absorption by the uh, uh, alphas. And this is the, the point one, is the resonant frequency of the alphas. So you can see this dip due to the absorption of the alphas, and this uh, another dip due to the protons. But what you, the other interesting aspect of this is that uh, when you include the expansion, then because of the cooling effects of the expansion, you can see a steeper, steeper slope of the evolution. Now, looking at the, in more detail at the spectra, you can see these are the density fluctuations of protons and ions, uh, and these are the, velocity, the parallel velocity fluctuations. So here you can see the evolution, the break more clearly. Uh, this is sort of our driven waves, and they, they've been driven at uh, the minus one. And you can see this, you recover this slope, which is close to the minus one, uh, but exactly at, the, at one, which is the resonant frequency, you can see the steepening of the spectrum of the proton fluctuations, while the, the alphas doing, are doing the same thing at 0.5. So you can see uh, the break in their respective fluctuations, uh, and uh, also in the, the effects on their velocities, which are slightly different uh, in this case. So this is just showing the details of the velocity distributions and uh, of the, for the protons and helium ions in the perpendicular direction, and this is uh, including the parallel, this parallel perpendicular direction. So we see some of the features and that are due to, to the drift that recover uh, the observed features. Uh, this is, again, um, at a smaller drift, you recover the um, uh, distribution function. This is the effect of expansion, showing how the expansion affects uh, the distribution, and you can compare the two, so there is uh, uh, basically uh, cooling in the perpendicular uh, direction. So you can look at the scales in the, in the perpendicular direction. So let me skip that part. And uh, the last thing I wanted to show you uh, is the effect of um, initial uh, turbulent spectrum. So what you see here this is basically the dispersion relation uh, obtained from the um, model. So this is not a linear dispersion relation. This is actually 
calculation that shows the relation between the uh, k modes, the parallel and perpendicular k modes, and the um, temporal fluctuation that you see in the code. And indeed, you recover these magnetosonic branches, uh, which are very strong. You can see some evidence here of the uh, uh, dissipating branches. This is with the drift. Uh, so um, the other thing that you see is that w while your initial spectrum only had these parallel modes, you have some scattering into the perpendicular direction and you start generating a spectrum of fluctuations uh, in the perpendicular. So you have oblique modes. So these modes are generated by scattering of these uh, parallel propagating waves. And the, the role of oblique modes is still not very clear. It's possible that they play uh, a significant role in the solar wind heating as well. And you can generate them by scattering. Actually, if you include the homogeneity in the background, which I didn't have time to talk about, but let me just show you the last the, the slide of this. Then here you generate a much stronger scattering. So if you have background homogeneity, then the, the scattering in the perpendicular direction uh, is very strong, and you can generate oblique modes by process very similar to phase mixing in, in fluid plasma. So this is, you start with, with only waves in this direction uh, in, in K, along Kx, but then you generate Ky, which is significant, um, with significant power. But anyway, let me go to the summary and conclusions. Basically, we have uh, observations that show uh, that we have two types of solar wind. We have uh, the fast and slow solar wind. In the fast wind, we see evidence of uh, turbulent magnetic uh, fluctuations, uh, as well as velocity and density, uh, non-Maxwellian features, uh, and anisotropy. And uh, we see, as well, evidence of drifting population of various ions. Now, the large-scale MHD waves uh, are still important and they can um, provide, at least theoretically, uh, the um, acceleration of the solar wind, uh, the bulk of the solar wind by momentum transfer. They can accelerate the, the protons uh, and, and the electrons, of course, uh, the ions will follow. But it turns out that um, you cannot reproduce the properties of the heavy ion just with uh, MHD waves. So uh, now we do have evidence of um, resonant waves as well and the effect of uh, resonance on the parameters of our plasma, as we see uh, in situ at 1 AU. So this is a strong suggestion that we have uh, kinetic uh, waves and instabilities that affect the population of the ions. So then uh, these ions are very likely uh, heated and uh, energized by the kinetic processes. Now, the turbulent spectrum that we see, uh, we can recover this as well in our uh, hybrid modeling. And the transition, we can also recover the transition to the dissipation range and the cascade that uh, causes the heating uh, of the heavy ions. But of course, the heating of protons, um, uh, while it is important, uh, it can be achieved uh, entirely by uh, MHD waves with the kinetic waves playing a secondary role and more important role uh, for the heavy ions. So the part that I didn't go into much detail is you have background homogeneity is also a way to generate oblique waves that can enhance the dissipation uh, of the fluctuations in the heating of the solar wind. Thank you. Well, uh, because these waves uh, dissipate very quickly, uh, it's not possible just to generate them in the lower corona and observe them at 1 AO. Because they would resonate uh, very soon after they are emitted and you don't see them. So because uh, there is evidence of these waves and we see them in the spectrum throughout the heliosphere, they must be generated uh, locally as well. Yes. I mean, it's because we see them from point three 
AU and on, and from our present state of knowledge, it's not possible just to propagate them from 1 or sun to 0.3 AU. They must be generated locally. So that's a cat that sort of tries to bite its own tail, right? So Sorry? That's a cat that's trying to bite its own tail. At least that's the same we have in Germany. So maybe that can trace somehow. Maybe. If you say you generate these high frequency waves out there, and then you use these high frequency that you waves that you generated out there to accelerate the wind and produce the, 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 the properties you showed here, you only have a secondary effect, so to speak. What's the first effect that's really generating the, these high frequency waves and brings the energy there and leads to this? Effect? Okay, so uh, uh, so this is. A a question uh, that you know people try to answer it with the turbulent cascade. So you have the, the large scale fluctuations that then uh, feed to smaller and smaller scales to the process turbulence, right? So then uh, turbulent cascade leads to smaller scale formation until you reach the dissipation scale. So contrary to the ion cyclotron small scales, the large scale waves you can really launch them from. Uh, one AU, uh, sorry, from uh, very near one or sun, or one or sun, and propagate them to one AU with very little uh, dissipation, because the viscous and resistive dissipation that may affect them or collisions disappear very quickly. So if you have these types of fluctuations, you can see them uh, very far out in the uh, in the heliosphere, okay, and they could be uh, the same type of wave, the same origin of fluctuation. So you have this large-scale energy source. So the question is, how do you transfer from this large scale to, to the small scale? And turbulence is turbulent cascade. Uh, and the fact that you have the sweeping frequencies because you're moving to lower and lower frequencies as you go to weaker field regions, so the resonance is at uh, lower frequencies, uh, is another possibility. But uh, you have this energy flux. It exists there. How do you get to the small scale? Again, there are processes that possibly can make that. And uh, it's not required, uh, as I showed. The small scales are mostly required for the heavy ions and the properties of the heavy ions. Uh, for the bulk of the plasma, you can still uh, do this with the, with the MHD waves. One missing piece to being able to test a lot of these models is not having helium temperature measurements in the corona, right? Do you know of anybody who's planning on uh, measuring these things? Yes. Measuring helium? You know, I know Silvano Fineschi had a, uh, a sounding rocket that looked at 304, helium 304, uh, at large distances. But I don't know whatever came of that. Well, they measured, the, there was, as you were saying, this is HACOR, I think it's called. Something like that. Uh, there was a, a, a rocket measurement that measured 304 up to maybe two solar radii or something like that. Were, were they able to get line with ion temperatures? But they got uh, some data and uh, they are in the process of uh, publishing them. I have, uh, you know, so, some images were published online, and uh, there is evidence that suggests, of course, that the helium is hot, but. Uh, uh, they did not publish the results, so I don't know for sure what they are measuring. You said we covered the common of side thirds. Does that mean it's an inertial range or strong turbulence range? Or is the inertial range? It's a weak turbulence. Well, ba basically, yes. With this um, hybrid model, usually you have homogeneous or initially homogeneous uh, plasma. And then uh, what we have done, we launched a, a spectrum of waves at the boundary. And that slope was minus 1, was not 5 thirds. Then as the waves uh, in, were injected into the plasma, then they cause self-consistent uh, formation of uh, turbulence. And then if you look at the spectra in the uh, center of our domain, far from the boundary, you find uh, you recover the spectrum, the five-thirds. Uh, 